all started just because of one little mark and trying to find some evidence about it. And thanks to our close friend and ex-colleague, Alec Mackay, we did, but this was through documentary evidence. So this is showing you what can happen. So I thought, well, if we can do it with this, maybe if I look at more, we'll find more about it. And uh, yes, we did. So some of the aims, and it's there for you to read and not for me to keep going over what I've written. This is what we're aiming to do, or I'm aiming to do, with the help of a number of volunteers. And I do point out my project is entirely voluntary with very, very little money. So the problem was, to do a good project, you have to look over a wide area. So this is what I thought I'd do. I'd go around all Buns in Aberdeen, Charmarie and Angus, and I'd come along with community archaeology. So I went around and I spoke to 25 different groups. I gave them exactly the same talk and explained how I wanted things to be done. So, out of these 25, although they were all very, very enthusiastic and wanted to take part, only five groups actually carried out work. Here's some of the, the groups in action. I say, at the moment, I'm still working at the Church of the Holy Road. Some of you, if you're here, you'll recognise yourself, perhaps. And I won't make any comment about you. I say, you do need binoculars for higher up. You need a good, good camera with a telescopic lens for higher up and a really good torch when you're inside. And my friend Dave here is taking it to the extreme of having a rest while he's looking for marks. And of course, Charlie and Hilary Murray helped to report marks on the bridge here. Uh, I don't think Hilary was very, very comfortable going down in this. Here are just some of the sites that we have done already. I shall go just through these very quickly because there's much more to get to on. There's no sense in me tech saying all these names to you, you can read them. And say, we're still working away on St. Giles and on the Church of the Holy Root because there are big areas. But one of the things that I do point out is when they're helping me, they do have to make sure that they look carefully and light a top with a torch from different angles. Because you see the first one, you look at it, just looks like letter I. But shine the torch a little differently, another leg comes up. And then the whole thing is not an eye, it becomes like a, a Roman five. Glance Castle went there, and it's great when you're doing a project because you get into bits that other people don't get into. So as you see, we've got quite a number of marks here. These two are some of the earliest marks, and they come from the very early part of the castle. I'm just doing this. <laughs> and this one, again, is in amongst the earlier parts, on the remains of a blocked up fireplace. One at the bottom is a very, early, a very late one, which was found up at the top of the castle. These are a photo of some of these marks. And we did get a bit of information about one of the masons, one of the later masons. But unfortunately, the area where he worked, there was nothing to see, but it was all lined. And by that period, you're coming a bit late to get to marks because they're painted in a totally different way. But while doing a bit of research, <sighs> sorry about this, I keep hitting it bit. We find a reference in, in some of the records in Dundee that this Alexander Nisbet worked in the West Wing in Chapel, and going through the records more, we actually found his mark. And as you can see, we found marks in other area here in the castle, but we didn't find them in the chapel. And this is because by this date, they didn't need to mark stones to be paid. The early masons had to mark 
are called banker's marks, so they could be paid by the number of blocks they cut. But after you come into the 16th, 17th century, they're paid in a entirely different way, so they don't need to do this. In St. Mary's Church, we did get one or two marks, though as you could see, the walls were all painted white, so it makes it very difficult. But once we got into the tower, we found a few marks more. Now, this is the kind of the, what the survey sheet looks after we've finished typing it up and not the scroll on our own site. But it's all detailed and it says exactly where each mark can be found. And this is how we do it, on a stone by stone, and course by course. And these are just some of the areas where the, these marks were found. Into Clare Castle, and this again is an interesting place. If you watch these two marks of future, we found them all down in the lower floor, nothing elsewhere, because this is the earliest part surviving. But what did come to light? South, Lord Southesk called me into his office and said, I've got a document to show you. And at the top, it gives the names of two masons. And this is getting names, masons, dates is great. So, at the bottom, because they were illiterate, they signed their marks. So there we have names, dates, marks, and also the information about how they were, what the work they had to do, and how they were going to be paid. And I think this is quite a valuable document because very few people really understand just how much they had to do and how they were paid. And if you note there, they were to work with six masons, and two of them is eight, but we actually got ten marks. So at some point, they must have brought in another two masons to work. Now, I bet they wouldn't work now for just some meal and cheese. And, well, maybe the beer, yes, but maybe not the cheese. And how they're going to be paid. I, I don't know the value of 20 merks, maybe somebody later on can tell me what 20 merks are now roughly worth. And there's the marks in stone. And moving to the old steeple in, in Dundee, this again was a very interesting uh, area to work in. This, these two marks are totally out of keeping with all the other marks in the area. The top left one was in an area just behind the door to the stairs, and it's an area that's obviously been renewed, replaced, so this is a later mark. The other mark at the bottom is found right up at the top of the cap house, and again, a later mark, I think. This may give you a little, uh, little clue as to some of the obstacles we have to overcome. The bells. We had to get out of that room every quarter of an hour if we were there, or if we were above it or below it, because the noise was deafening. But we did actually manage to find marks in between these 15 minute sessions. But what also came to light is during, during looking through old records and things, we got the name of one of the later Masons. And it also gives you the conditions of work he had, which is quite hard actually when you look at it. Again, say, I don't think a modern Mason would be working like this at all. And but actually, when you see what he got paid, and his, you know, getting paid when he's still for 40 days, that was actually very good for that time. Not making a hard life, but at least he got recompense for it. Another little bit I came across was the name of another, Mason John Milne, who went on to become very well known as one of the great master masons in Scotland. Going to Arbroath Abbey, we did get a number of more marks here, 64 masons. And you may be saying, oh, I've seen that mark before, I've seen this mark before, but don't think you know exactly the date and everything. These two at the top are actually much, much later and totally out of sync with all the other marks we got. These are just some of the areas we found marks. Also do elevation showing marks, so we can tell exactly where it was found. 
very few marks were found in the lower part of, of the abbot's house here, but we found other ones higher up. And this is to give you an idea of how it pulled together some of this. And you can see quite clearly, you can start to work out through the dates where each mason worked. And it can help you draw a better picture of the building. In probably just it's probably difficult to see some of the dates on here, but there's definitely a big group at the start of the 14th century. And other ones are brought in over periods. But they seem to be restricted to definitely building periods of dates. Let's say just little friends crept in occasionally to pay us a visit. St. Rosson's Marquage, I did this in July with the group here, and I have to say it's the first time I've worked with a group of the friends of the church, and they were absolutely gobsmacked that there was so many marks found here, 830. And it's the first group of friends who can say they know their own church stone by stone. Here we've got, I think, possibly the master mason and instructions on how he wanted this built. As you can see, the stone is like block by block. And he also cut his mark in a very clear way on the way he dressed the stone. So I'm wondering if he may be the master mason because of these instructions. But again, another of his marks, again, cut in a precise way. But there were also other marks here which were not cut in a precise way. And actually some very poorly cut, and I don't think he cut these marks. I think maybe he did a little bit of cheating when he got his apprentices to cut these blocks. Again, these are the gaius, and a very prolific, the most prolific one is mason number seven, and the master mason with 106 we recorded. Though he, for some reason he didn't work in the third floor, but he worked everywhere else. There are also notes that some masons were brought in just to work on the spiral stair. So they are obviously used to working on carved blocks. Let's say Dawson's is just to give you a rough idea of the distribution of the marks. And I have to say, I've never seen so many in one place before. Everywhere was covered. We do a sort of each floor plan and then we do the elevations as well. But they don't need to be exact. As long as you know the location of a mark, that is the main thing. Again, this is the upper floor showing all the numbered mark as each mark gets its own individual number. Other features that we found, in a number of cases we find two marks on the one stone. Uh, nobody can really answer this yet, but I'm wondering if perhaps it is the, the master mason perhaps approving somebody's work, or perhaps one of these may have been his apprentice, especially with the top right hand one, as you know, it's a triangle which is half of the, the other one, so he may have been an apprentice and he's carried on and taken part of the mark. Here in the Brecon Cathedral, we got a mark with the initials of the mason, but so far the people who recorded these for me have not been able to find any documentary evidence to be able to tie these down. But we're hopeful. And some of the problems that can arise when undertaking a survey, well, luckily we don't need to go up split ladders or go up and get pulled up. But uh, some stairs can be very, very narrow and dangerous. So I make sure that everybody's signed a form before they go up or allowed into a place so they don't come back on me. And narrowing steeples, it's very, very difficult to look up and try and photograph anything up there. Height, of course, in the large chapters where I'm working just now, you have to get a strong neck, I have to say, because it gets very sore looking up for a long time. Condition. Some of these marks are just being caught in time. In another year or two, some are going to be gone completely. And paint, especially in St. Monica's Church, was terrible. They coated it with paint recently, and some of it was bubbling where darkness got in, so it was very, very difficult to find marks. The erosion, spalling, the graffiti, they've all got a huge problem. And here you can see these marks are on the last legs, the spalling of the stone. It's just, you, 
but not against them, that was it, they were gone. And problems of following a specific mark. Now this is what I'm saying, if you think you've seen a mark, and you say, oh, I've seen it somewhere else, and you automatically assume it's the same mason. Well, be careful. Now say you follow this chart, the star. Well, then we started in 1080, that's great, it's a type of star. But then it's the same type of star ends up here. So, we also did all this work as well. So, you can see what I mean. You have to go be very careful and not assume. You have to look where if you can at documentary evidence to tie it in. And in some cases we are managing to go back and find the names of masons, as you can see. But anything before the Reformation can sometimes be a problem because so many documents were destroyed. But in some places, certainly down in, in, in London, in Edinburgh, not Edinburgh, down south in England, there's quite a number of documentary evidence still surviving and they can tie in some early marks. I'd like to thank How much more time, John? I'm okay, okay. Okay. Right, I'll just. Another wee bit to show you the database. There is a database for the project. Um, so when you go into the database, this is the sort of thing that come up. There's a drop down menu, and if you click on any building, it will come up. As I say, this is our growth, it will come up with a bit of information. And down the side are, are all the, the plans, elevations, etc. And there's a survey sheet there that you click another one. If you go through to the actual marks, it's a bit you can drop down the marks and say click on the triangle, it'll come up with all of these have got a triangle in them because we categorize everything and everybody sees a mark in a different way. So you have to we try to make as many different choices as possible. That's why we have this little diagram. If you're looking for a specific mark, I want to try and trace where you can find it. So also if you go then and click on this mark, you can go through to map and it'll show you where that map is found, in that mark. But as I said, you have to be careful and make sure that you look at the dates of the buildings. Otherwise you'll think, oh, that mason has got around quite a bit. He may have if they're in the same century and roughly the same dating group, but not if there's about a century between. And just a little bit, Master of Works. But his tomb was done by someone else. And we've also took many stone masons at St. Andrews. And that's it. Thank you.